lectures were conceived as part and parcel of advancing the academic and intellectual project of the University of Zululand. In its strategic plan, Unizulu committed itself to an ambitious project of becoming a node of Afri African thought. And the uh, vice chancellor, all this started with your idea. And as many people have actually said, the way of the master consists in doing what's one's best and using oneself to, as a measure to gauge others. And uh, in this, I can say, the vice chancellor has uh, led from the front. But the whole idea that we are doing and engaged in at this point, Professor Ndlo Vukacheni, is what uh, Confucius said, that the, I hear and I forget, I see and I remember, I do and I understand. With these uh, seminars, we are taking the idea that was spawned by the Vice Chancellor last year to make sure that we give practical expression to the university's uh, strategic plan of uh, turning this university into a node for African thought. And uh, it behooves me to mention that it, the position of an idea in such exercises is very sacrosanct. What we think we become. As I've of, often said, and many people have said, that it is in ideas that ideas on thoughts can be turned into words. And words then become actions. And repeated actions become habits. And it is through our habits that we build character. And ultimately, our character defines our destiny. And this is at the heart of what uh, the mission of the university is all about. Without uh, trying to pontificate, I'll leave that to the able hands of the vice chancellor of the university to take us through and lay the foundation before Professor Ndlovo Kacheni gives us the most important lecture, which builds on the work that has been done by the university and the university's senate. With those uh, intro Dr. Max, may I ask uh, the Vice Chancellor and Principal of the University of Zuland, Professor Mtose, to give us an opening remarks. Um, to the chairperson of uh, this session, Professor Siepe, members of University Council Online, members of University Management, deans of faculties and heads of departments, academics and students, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you all in 2023, first Vice Chancellor's Public Lecture Webinar Series, this lecture, Decoloniality of Knowledge in Post-Colonial Africa, to be delivered by our distinguished scholar, Professor Sabelo J. Ndovu mm -hmm. Gachini, builds on the UNISU's inaugural conference of African thought. As colleagues recalled, the conference was convened to give practical expression to UNISU's strategic goal of establishing the university is an authentic African university and as a node of African thought. In the last decade or so, there has immense growing academic work, which some scholars have claimed a decolonial turn. Read de Oliver, 2021. It is an era in academia that has seen concerted critique of grand narrative developed from global north and which have served to marginalize knowledge, needs, cultures, and voices of non-dominant representations of global south. The colonial turn also implies a question of, or a shift from prevailing neuronormativity 
as a prison through which knowledge and truth are to be judged. Mugari 2021 says, given the hegemonic nature of the colonial power matrix, they argue that the decolonial approach also, open quote, entails a recognition of one's positionality as a scholar, critique, and speaker, recognizes the necessity to do center and pluralize knowledge formations, offering alternative ways to conceptualize and experience the world, problematizes default positions, destabilizes the structure to rehabilitate epistemic formations that continue to be repressed under coloniality. Close quote. Galen's perspective touches on some main contours of raging debates that have gained traction in recent years. It also captures the dynamic nature of post-colonial social relations, which some scholars have argued manifest a myriad of ways through among which is the idea of different and overlapping colonialities on how they sustain each other in insidious ways. Program director, allow me to first touch on briefly three main of these colonialities. The colonialities of power, knowledge, and being. I will then spend some time sharing some ideas and on how we can think about the decolonial task that lays ahead of us. I conclude my presentation by referring to initiatives that UNESCO has embarked upon in the furtherance of decolonial journey. The colonialities of power, knowledge, and being as part of a growing vocabulary and conceptualization of emanating from the decolonial ten epoch. Lunes Pardo made reference to the notion of these three colonialities. Regarding the concept of colonial power, it is where the colonizer imposes ideas, for example, on development and progress through ideological documentization that distinguishes the colonizer as civilized, advanced from the colonized, and the colonized as wild and backward. Such because discourses become normalized as a truth that represents reality. In this way, the colonizer achieves ideological and discursive compliance. In the coloniality of knowledge, which is the second point, the colonizer as implied in, in the coloniality of power, universalizes knowledge of the North into something homogeneous and neutral. Such knowledge gets produced in research, governed by canons defined by the colonizer. It also is transmitted in teaching and learning encounters at the top floor as I will illustrate later. Consistent with the above mentioned colonialities, the idea of coloniality as being, is being embedded. The perception of natural superiority of the colonizer and marginalization of those who are not part of that group. This scenario results into everyday idea of being as represented in white European civilized men and belief of inferiority by the colonized. It further extends into development of aspirations to become like the colonizer. In sum, it is argued that all colonialities shown are intrinsically related to the coloniality of power, which is the foundational of the three colonialities. They are connected through epistemological and ontological dimensions in ways that define people's lived experiences in the global North and global South. The dominant ideological and discursive practices and strategies deployed in a particular society 
produce wild use that serve to create, maintain, and reproduce Hebrews' identities as well as what counts as knowledge, how to produce and disseminate knowledge. The point I'm making seeks to illustrate here is that the entanglement of nature of coloniality of knowledge phenomenon that the decolonization projects must confront. In this connection, I would like to briefly highlight two aspects of what I believe form part of the metaphoric black box of the coloniality of knowledge into which the decolonial thinkers must peer, uncover, and understand what is going on with a view to working out ways of challenging the status quo and coming up with alternative worldviews that disrupt the epistemological and ontological mechanisms that form the pillars of coloniality of power and coloniality of being, and which manifest in people's lived experiences. From the black box, I pick up research of knowledge production, processes and pedagogical encounters between educators and students for scrutiny and self-reflection. And I hope that my learned academics this morning are really going to pick up this as a challenge as we move forward. Knowledge production and anti-colonial pedagogies. In South Africa, the colonial theoretical ferment was fueled during 2015-2016 by student-led hashtag Fees Must Fall and hashtag Roads Must Fall campaigns which advocated for a decolonization of curricula. In this regard, Galen says, open quote, this brings to the fore long overdue debates over who determines curricula, what models, templates, and agendas they follow, who they serve, and how they can be changed so as to bring real emancipation, emancipation and social racial, sexual, sexual justice, close quote. The campaigns reverberated beyond the boundaries of South Africa, feeding into decolonial ten discourses. On this is the notion of epistemological boundaries, which are set by the colonizer. In terms of epistemological boundaries in knowledge production, Universities as centers of knowledge production are expected to be part of the solution to the problem of the coloniality of knowledge. However, a pertinent issue that one, may, one might raise in this regard relates to the evidence of epistemological boundaries academics and students operate within when they carry out research. How much research by extension, knowledge pro produced demonstrates a de-Westernization and a removing of practices away from Eurocentrism. How can we recognize that this process is taking place? An example of how this question can be answered is found in a study by Magari 2021 of three South African universities, doctoral thesis, references lists, in the discipline of media studies and journalism. The data showed that there was tension between producing knowledge that conforms to Eurocentric disciplinary knowledge and that which transgresses epistemological boundaries. The, the study also argued that, open quote, theoretical frameworks that students use in their research studies operate like regulatory and classificatory mechanisms by means of which conceptual boundaries of a discipline are set, contested, and policed." Close quote. This works constrain epistemic disobedience and border jumping, ensuring that epistemic boundaries are not crossed. By the way, the decolonial framework is one area I know where border jumping is encouraged. Instead, there was a prevalence of what Joe Fukacheni referred to as piecemeal inclusion of Africans into a long existing European game without changing the rules of the game, close quote, 
And I will leave this to the distinguished scholar, Professor Ndlo Fukacheni, to elaborate on this matter. Thus, an overriding observation can be made that there still exists a deeply conservative self entrenched and hegemonic knowledge production system in South Africa. What then is to be done? Program director, it has been suggested that in times of social crisis, such as what is being faced in the current dispensation of decolonial term in higher education, there is need to, to deploy pedagogical approaches that are sensitive to power relations, social crisis, and political transformation. Following Hebb's call, I would like to invite the community of scholars that we are trying to build in this project to dig deep into a rich tradition of liberation and other emancipatory pedagogies developed by scholars of Global South in a quest to help students acknowledge their self-location and responsibility within settler colonialism, as well as teaching and rewarding their resistance. Finally, given the South African hashtags students campaigns that gave a compelling case for unpacking the coloniality of education black box, some scholars, Zamalas, have called for explicitly anti-colonial pedagogical interventions that break the continuous reproduction and sustenance of colonial structure through education. According to this perspective, anti-colonial pedagogy must, among other things, subvert colonial power dynamics that play out on the lecture hall by looking beyond the dominant curricular frameworks for ideas. Such pedagogical encounters must equip students with tools to locate and value resistance coloniality in their everyday lives. As I conclude, I would like to pose and reflect on the question that if we do not see, as already stated, much evidence of crossing of the abyssal line between Western and African knowledge formations in the core business of the university, what must we le leverage to turn the situation around? At UNISU, we have decided to confront this challenge by crafting the UNISU Vision 27, which sees the institution becoming a node of Afri for African thought. The launch of this vision in November 2022 and associated activities aimed at developing ways of disobeying the Western epistemic frames of reference. The Vice Chancellor's public lectures and webinar series must be understood as situated in this space. With these few ways, I once again have a pleasure in welcoming you to today's session and look forward to productive deliberations. And I thank you. Uh, Professor Mtosa, thank you very much uh, for laying the foundation and also for reminding us that the university is a site of contestation. And then uh, also reminding us that uh, we have a responsibility given our history to look at the epistemologists, especially the epistemologists uh, that were part and parcel of colonial domination. And I do think that uh, in putting this uh, series together, one would achieve what you refer quite eloquently as uh, the subversion of uh, colonial power dynamics. And uh, we could not have done any better in taking us forward in this regard than by inviting uh, Professor Sabelo Ndrovu Gajeni to take us through this enterprise, this uh, challenge, this project. And his title, the title for today, has been um, chosen deliberately to play around uh, the book title, uh, uh, Coloniality of Power in Post-Colonial Africa. 
but they're given that we are a site of knowledge production, knowledge contestation, and knowledge dissemination. The title has been cleverly put as a coloniality of knowledge in post-colonial Africa. Just one way to say about uh, Professor Ndrovu, who, as I reminded him earlier, that we had the pleasure of sharing a stage some time back when we were tackling another important issue, which had to deal with the land question in South Africa. Professor Ndrovu at the time was uh, located at the uh, UNISA, where he was a professor. And uh, right now he's a professor and chair of epistemology of the global south with emphasis in Africa in a German university. But consistent with the idea of a note for African thought, we have, uh, or the University of Zuland has decided to turn the university into a magnet for African scholars wherever they are. We're talking about the global Africana. Without much ado, may I ask Professor Ndrovu to ascend the stage by and address us on the topic. Professor Ndrovu, you're welcome. And uh, thank you very much for making the time. Oh. And I hope uh, Germany is uh, as warm uh, as it is in South Africa at the moment. Good thank luck. you so much. Thank you. Thank you um, for the words of introduction. Let me start by recognizing the vice chancellor and the principal of the University of Zuland, uh, Professor Kodiso Mutose, and uh, the, the council of the university and uh, the extended management. And I must say all protocol are observed. Um, I want to, to, to do maybe four uh, things if, if time allows. Uh, uh, I will try to first of all, introduce uh, this talk by opening up to what I've called the contemporary politics of knowledge. I think that's a good starting point, uh, which will make us understand why in the 21st century, we still speak of colonization and the decolonization, particularly in the domain of knowledge. <clears throat> then secondly, I will also take you back a bit to understand how is knowledge colonized? And I will try to introduce some concepts which will enable us to unpack and understand how knowledge is colonized because if we don't understand how it is colonized, it will be very difficult for us to understand how to decolonize it. So mm -hmm. in helping us to understand how knowledge is colonized, I will introduce the concept of the cognitive empire. And of course, the concept of coloniality of knowledge, but I will try to pull it in such a way that we see the consequences of coloniality of knowledge, not on other people, but on ourselves as African intellectuals. Mm -hmm. Then thirdly, I will then tend to a decolonization. And uh, I'm turning to decolonization because it is not a new struggle. We're continuing mm -hmm. a long standing struggle. And it would be important for us to understand the waves and the turns. In, decoloni in decolonization of knowledge uh, so that we locate ourselves properly. And hoping that in that intervention, I will also contribute to UNISULU's aspiration to be a node for African thought. Then finally, I will conclude with highlighting the current task of decoloniality. And hopefully also that will feed into, into into Unizulu's growth as a note for African thought. So allow me to start with the, the, first section, the first set of reflections. Generally, if I had come physically, I was not going to give a lecture. I was actually going to have a conversation and a dialogue with all of you as you could, as I listened to the vice chancellor. Almost everyone is almost caught up and engulfed by this issue of decolonizing. And we need then 
to have conversations rather than long lectures again. We need to have that uh, so that we dialogue over why, what can we do, how can we rise adequately to this challenge which is upon our generation. But let me start. Let me start by saying we need to understand the moment we are living in. And when I'm talking about the moment we're living in, I'm talking about this moment, which is also very exciting, but at the same time, very scary. Uh, it is scary in the sense that questions, epistemological questions, basic epistemological questions, which were somehow settled, have now been reopened. And they are now crying for deeper engagement. And at the starting point, perhaps for us to understand each other, what are those basic epistemological questions which has come to haunt us within the institutions of higher education and within the knowledge mm -hmm. domain? And I will try to outline them very quickly so that uh, <clears throat> this, this becomes an ideal starting point to understand the problems of colonialism and, and the decolonization. The first basic epistemological question is a very simple one. Where does knowledge come from? I think that's a long standing question and we need, it has come back to us and needing perhaps a newer reflections. The second one is also a long standing question. And that is the question, is there any connection between identity and the knowledge. And then the third one, which is also not new, but is also a haunting question. What is the place of geography in knowledge? Does knowledge have a geography? And then fourthly, is also another very complicated question. And this is the question of what is the relationship between our experiences, our biographies, and the knowledge? And the last one, which is, I think, the fifth, is also a perennial question. And this perennial question is, what is the connection between ideology and the knowledge? Having put these questions on the table, I will then move on to the second set of reflections in attempting to, to answer these questions. The Eurocentric conceptions is that when you think about where does knowledge come from, you need to go to matter, you need to go to idea, you need to go to mind, body, duality. And when it comes to the question of, um, of identity and the knowledge, in Eurocentric thinking, that is a no-go area. A person like me who is trained in historical studies, one issue for certain, which we were banned and they were penalized heavily forever saying is to say I or we in an academic writing. And the, the flag which was raised was always the flag of objectivity Scientist, being scientific, being detached, and the knowledge, trying to produce knowledge in a disembodied, trying to articulate and disembodied knowledge. So it was said that never ever bring your identity into knowledge. Mm -hmm. You need to be, to, to be detached, you need to be objective, you need to be scientific. Then when it came to geography and the knowledge, Again, in Eurocentric thinking, they speak about universality of knowledge. Mm -hmm. And again, they go back to the issues of objectivity, knowledge which is truthful across space and time. That's what they, they, they say is the valid knowledge. Then when it comes to experiences and the biographies, again, they say, pack your biography in the bag when you do knowledge, be objective, be impartial, be scientific. And when it comes to ideology, 
Here where I'm based at the University of Bayreuth in Germany, we are actually divided into two camps. Those who claim to be producing scientifically driven knowledge and those like me who are criticized as pursuing ideologically driven knowledge. <clears throat> but we are living at a moment where these Eurocentric claims are being challenged. For instance, yeah. when we go back to the first question of where does knowledge come from, there is now very complicated debate on the relationship between epistemology and ontology. And I think the vice chancellor referred to some of those. The existential questions and the epistemological questions and the justice questions needs to be taken into, a, into account, particularly epistemic uh, justice questions. Yeah. And then when it comes to, to the issue of identity and the knowledge, in the decolonial and the post-colonial thinking, there is a very clear and a deliberate argument that we cannot lie to ourselves that there is no eco politics of knowledge, mm -hmm. that there is no body politics of knowledge. We cannot lie and say there is no embodied knowledge and that there is no locus of enunciation or social uh, location in the production of knowledge. And when it comes to geography, in the decolonial and the post-colonial thinking, there is a clear projection of what we call geopolitics of knowledge, the geography of knowledge, and the situatedness of knowledge. And then when it comes to biography and experience, in the post-colonial and the decolonial uh, uh, <clears throat> scholarship, there is a clear articulation of body politics of knowledge, the biography of knowledge, and uh, indeed the embodiedness of knowledge. Mm -hmm. And uh, you remember when Fanon concluded his book, he said, oh, my body, make me a person who always questions. She never said, oh, my head. Or my mind. He said, my <laughs> and the, when it comes to ideology and the knowledge, of course, even in the Europeans, they seem now to converge. You, can, you know the work of Michel Foucault on, on power knowledge dynamic, that the issue of neutrality, knowledge is always political. So this is what is facing us, uh, ladies and gentlemen within the academy. And the question is, are we at this moment going to be able to rise adequately to this challenge? In Africa, in South Africa, is a bit of a different context. In the, in the US, in, the, in France, there is an attempt to use law to ban post-colonial and the decolonial thinking there is an attempt to, to ban critical race theory, decolonial thought, post-colonial mm -hmm. thought, intersectional uh, thinking, and the others. And the idea behind banning these is that they are identity politics and they are not scientific. So we have, we have this challenge, we have this battle to fight. Uh, but let me move on. I've put that, and this, I normally say, once I put this, I feel like I must go and sit down. I've done my work. <laughs> <laughs> but let me move on to the second set of reflections. And these reflections now takes us to the second part of this a public lecture. And this is the question of, can knowledge be colonized? And this is an important question because when we, call, we talk about decolonizing, we must understand how knowledge is colonized. And we don't need to go too far to understand the challenges. Steve Bantupiko put it as a challenge long, long ago when he said, 
the most important weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the control of the mind of the oppressed. And this question, a lot of people caught it widely, but it is a challenge because you need to know how does somebody end up controlling a mind of somebody and what technologies are used to do that. And this is why it is important to use that as an entry point to understand the, to try and understand how knowledge is colonized. And immediately, Pico poses that challenge. He is fundamentally saying it's possible that knowledge of others can be colonized by others. The minds of others can be colonized by others. But if with different heads, you wonder how the knowledge which is in one head can be transferred into another head. But uh, that is what we need to engage with in order to understand the coloniality of knowledge. And here I'm trying to introduce two concepts because in order to, to think ahead and not to be stuck in what colonialism bequeathed on us, we need to develop new concepts, concepts which will take us forward and which will make us see things more clearly. And the concept of cognitive empire, I think is one concept which can help us to understand the invasion, the mental invasion of universes of other people by thoughts of others. And in that process, imposing particular knowledge systems, displacing others, and consequently shaping the consciousness of other people. And I'm using here the concept of cognitive empire because that concept also is complex in that it is very, but it enables us to, to see the chameleonic nature of, of, of colonialism the corona-like uh, uh, features of colonialism, that it mutates, it invisibilizes itself, it, it camouflages itself, it disguises itself. So, so it is important that we use that concept to, to, un, to, to, to hunt it and expose it wherever it is, it is, it is hiding. And they, it is this concept which led so many scholars like Ali Mazuri speak about cultural schizophrenia. Uh, allowed us to talk about captive minds and then Guku Wationgo to talk about colonization of the mind and uh, Fanon to speak about pitfalls of national consciousness and alienation, which is a problem which we are facing. But I need to move really to something which is very practical and uh, which affects us every day in the knowledge domain. And uh, this is the, what we call the current global economy of knowledge. UNISU, all the 26 universities in South Africa and all the universities on the continent and in the world, they are actually participating in this global economy of knowledge. And they, for those who push the concept of the global economy of knowledge, when they listen to somebody like me speaking, they say, no, but uh, in Lovogajeni, you seem to be stuck in the past. You seem to be talking like in the, in the 1970s, not in the 21st century. And then they will say, you know what? Colonialism came and it came to, and it, it was dismantled in the 20th century. So why are you talking the way you are talking? And they will tell us that today, the discourse of today is about collaborations. Is about partnerships. I think you can you can pick that from the arguments of Professor uh, Jonathan Yansen in some of his writings, where he was trying to dismiss decolonization, and the idea that at the moment the world is is so entangled together, there is no periphery, there is no center. We are now in a in a in a, in a global village, and therefore knowledges are cross-fertilizing each other. I wish it was like that. I, I also wish it was like that. But the reality of the matter is that we need to go back to Amilcar Cabral. Let's not claim easy victories. Uh, let's not tell lies. It's uh, the, the, in, the, in the knowledge domain, there is still an even intellectual division of labor. 
and the, and the, here I'm talking really practical and the, and the colleagues at the University of Unizul, they will understand what I'm talking about immediately. One issue for certain, for me who is now based in Europe, I see people every summer dropping into the continent to go and they gather data. They tell, it, they tell us they are going for field work. So they go and they gather raw data in Africa. Why are they not gathering it in Europe? Mm -hmm. Why do they gather it in Africa? So they gather the data, then come back. And when they come back, they process it into theory, into models, into concepts, which are then consumed on the continent. Mm -hmm. So basically you can see the uneven intellectual uh, a division of labor there, Africa being a site of extraction of data, Europe being mm -hmm. a site of production of theories, mm -hmm. of concepts, mm -hmm. and the models, which are then consumed again on the continent. So in such a situation, and this is a reality, and you can see it in what uh, Pauline Untonji, the philosopher, philosopher from Benin, talks about academic and the intellectual dependence. That even in our writings as African scholars, we still draw more theory from Europe and North America and the raw data from Africa. In other words, data is African, theory is European. And the, I, I don't need to explain it too much. So many people who, who, who have assumed Euro, Eurocentric surnames, Marxist, Derridian, Foucauldian, ETC. I've never heard people who say I'm a Gukian, I'm a Amazurian. They all want to be associated with the dead white man. <laughs> <laughs> and then the other aspect which shows where we are, uh, the problems that the problems are not yet gone is also the issue of where do we publish our work? Mm -hmm. In order to be recognized as a, an intellectual, as an academic, we are still under pressure to publish in what is called international peer-reviewed journals. And the international does not mean if you are at UNISUL and you, are, you publish in a, in a Nigerian journal, then that is international. That is not international in the mm -hmm. coloniality mm -hmm. conception of international. Even mm -hmm. if you are at UNIZUL and you publish in a journal in Argentina, uh, in Latin America, it is not international. Even if you publish in a journal in, in the Caribbean or in India or in Asia, it is not international. International is Europe and North America. Mm -hmm. That's and even our own institution like the National Research Foundation, the way we graduate the accredited and the, and the unaccredited channels, it still smells of this structure in the sense that to get an A rating, a B rating, you need to publish in these journals, which are in Europe and North America. If you publish in South African ones, of course you will get a C or something like that. <laughs> so so it's, it's a reality really which we need to think uh, very careful about it, uh, uh, and uh, and uh, and I don't want to talk about the other uh, very challenging aspect of it. Practically, even me, I'm speaking here. I'm speaking to mainly Zulu-speaking people, but we are speaking in English at the moment. Yeah. And uh, the question of language, the privileging of colonial languages, and the marginalization yeah. of African languages is another issue which is very important which we need to take into account when we talk about coloniality of knowledge. And the, all of this takes us to, we need to grapple with the consequences of this. I think Nguku Wationgo put it better than anybody else when he talks about the consequences of the cognitive empire, when he talks about, when he gives the picture of a cultural bomb being detonated at the center of a universe of a people. If I detonate a cultural bomb at the center of UNISU, the Zulus will never be Zulus again. 
So he speaks about the effect of a cultural, a cultural bomb, which annihilates a people's belief in their names, in their languages, in their environment, in their heritage of struggles, in their unity, in their capacities, and ultimately in themselves. And then he also uses the example of the computer for people like us who are now using computers every day. And he says, what the cognitive empire does is almost similar to removal of the hard disk of previous memory and the previous knowledge and the downloading into our minds the software of European memory. And he says the consequence of all this is dislocation of the mind. And they, it is to these dislocations that we need to deal with because the dislocations come in different ways. Um, people can be located in Zululand, in South Africa, in the region, uh, in, on the continent, but is still epistemically thinking as though they are in Washington, in Berlin, and in London. And this is where we will talk about the disconnect between social location and the epistemic location. <clears throat> For instance, when I came here in, uh, in Germany in 2020, my first uh, <clears throat> engagement was to give a keynote address at the, in, in the Netherlands. It was an international conference. And I gave the keynote address and somebody from the floor says, you are talking about decolonization, but we have moved from Africa. You are now in Europe. <laughs> how, does, how do you do decolonization from Europe? And then I quickly, I quickly ran into the arsenals, which I know. And I said, you need not to confuse things here. There is social location, there is epistemic location, there is geographical location. Don't confuse my physical movement with my epistemic location. Don't confuse <laughs> my movement of the body with the movement of my social location. It doesn't work that way. You can be... In, in Nigeria since the birth until you die and be the most Eurocentric person without having moved physically because of the impact of coloniality. And this is why you will find people like, like uh, W.E. Tupa empowering us with concepts like a double consciousness. You find uh, thinkers like Carter Godwin Woodson telling us that we must understand the miseducation vis-a-vis re-education. You, you find the scholars like Al Mazuri talking about cultural schizophrenia and the Fanon talking about pitfalls of, uh, of consciousness. But it also then has implications for our practical uh, practices of knowledge production. We are, as African intellectuals, divided, divided into those who have confidence and have radically emulated and assimilated the issues of uh, objectivity, universality, unsituatedness, and the cognitive neutrality standard and the protocols which have been issued from the cognitive empire. So we have some who really believe strongly in those. Then we have others who are occupying, I think it was Sebo Malingos who spoke about the issue of liminarity being in between, in betweenness, uh, in trying to produce knowledge where you are always trying to balance the, 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 the African imperatives and the European imperatives. Then you have others who then become very angry and they, they take the, what, 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 what is called radical alterity or radical difference, whereby they then try to reject everything European and they try to say we have our own distinctive uh, knowledge. The danger there also is that you end up in, in problems of essentialism, falling into the paradigm of difference, falling into nativism, and falling into ghettoization of knowledge. Then we have also the other positionality which is taken by African intellectuals, which is caused by the, 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 the economic problems, uh, the psychophatic tradition and the compradorial position in knowledge production, whoever is all about opportunism and the survival. Uh, then you have some who are uh, trying to push the, the unfinished decoloniality struggles. 
So we have we have we have this 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 reality. Uh, and uh, having said this, I think I've said enough about a uh, coloniality of knowledge. Now I need to move to 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 talk about the 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 the, the therapy. How do we move out of this? But we we will never be successful in moving out of this if we don't understand really the core issues of, of decolonizing. In decolonizing, it is not only epistemic questions which matter. Epistemic questions are entangled in a very complex way with the existential questions. And I will try to demonstrate very quickly. Uh, uh, one, the first question which prompted the pioneers of decolonization was this idea of being defined as a problem in the world. Native people, African people, those who were deemed to be black, they were defined as a problem. A problem which has to be solved. And sometimes the mm -hmm. solution was really genocide. Let's finish them off, they are a problem. They belong to the past. They don't belong to the present. And then you will find this question in the work of W.E.P. Dupois, who posed the what does it feel to be defined as a problem in the world? So that's an existential question which has implications, epistemic implications. Then you can also go to the work of Emi Asize, who poses three tormenting questions. Who am I, what are we, and who are we in this white world? That's also existential questions, which has implications for, 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 for epistemic work. And they, you will find also that in order to do, to do all this, they then say the black people, African people, native people have no history. They are not human beings in the first instance. And that directly is the one which then provoked the nationalist historiography, nationalist writing, a, of history to challenge colonial claims that we have no history. Then we have also another existential question, the existential questions of development, whereby the native, those deemed as native black and African are said to be, they can't develop this themselves. They can't self-develop. They can't self-improve. They need to be developed by others. You know, the civilizing mission. Uh, the, the, the conversion, the salvation, and the, all that, that it must come from outside. And that has provoked the thinkers to bring in a dependency theory and a development theory in response to that. So, so, so I'm trying to also say, as we think about decolonization, it is a deeper question, which also has existential questions. And in my work, the work which I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to also then say, in order to think about decolonization, we need to think about the terms in a, in a, in a, in a de, in decolonization. And uh, quickly, I will talk about, I, I'm thinking about the black radical term in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the decolonization, which comes uh, originally from the diaspora. Uh, uh, and that is expressed in various concepts like Ethiopianism, Gaveism, Negritude, and African personality. Then we have the African nationalist turn. Then we have the Marxist uh, turn. Then we have the post-colonial turn. Then we have the gender turn. And then we have the current insurgent and the resurgent uh, decolonial turn of the 21st century, which actually builds on these other turns. And uh, because of time, I will move very fast here. Uh, of course, if you want to understand the, the black radical turn, you will need maybe perhaps to go back to foundational questions. What is Africa? What is Africa to Africans? And what is Africa to the world? And then you can also maybe move on to the epic event in Black Thought, which is the event of the Haitian Revolution of 1791 to 1890 to 1804. And of course, giving birth to Black, Africana, African-American and African studies and indeed uh, <clears throat> African thought. Uh, and they also you, you, you can then link that to, 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 to the issues, to various issues, and they try to look at the genealogies, the trajectories and the horizons 
from Gaveism to Pan-Africanism to Black Power to Harlem Renaissance to Negritude to Rastafarianism to Ethiopianism to Digos African Consciousness up to now. So you will need to really to dig deeper into that. I heard the Vice Chancellor saying we need to dig deeper into liberatory traditions. And that, that, that will be a best way to do it. But I want also to sound a warning. A warning after 1945, there's something which we need to think more carefully about. After 1945, we see the world shifting from empire to modern nation states. And that shift is celebrated as decolonization. And the warning which I want to, to issue is that we need to be careful. The modern wealth system is a very clever system. When anti-colonial, anti-systemic forces converge on it, with the intention to destroy it, it issues new global orders, which disguises it and gives it a new lease of life. And we must be careful that the shift from empire to modern nation states, despite the fact that we also participated in fighting against the empire, sacrificed and the people died, we must be careful the system was also engaged in rebooting itself, giving itself a new lease of life. One, you will understand that the United States was emerging as a power. And as it was emerging as a power, it also did not want Britain to have all of these colonies and France to have all of these colonies. It wanted the physical empire to be dismantled so that Capital from across the Antarctic can march across the world easily into this, into a world organized into nation states. So there is a lot of continuity between empire and the modern nation states. This is why even in South Africa, where there was roads must fall and the fees must fall, the state is not normally as active in anti-decolonial work as the, the, the students and the, 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 the forces which are pushing for decolonization because the state basically across the world is a core in the modern world system. Mm -hmm. I wanted to, to, to say that, uh, but uh, let me move on to say then uh, one, one, one issue for certain, and I will be very telegraphic here, is the nationalist turn in the in, 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 in decolonization. And the, the nationalist turn, you will see political leaders like Nkrumah, Nyerere, and the others very active in, mm -hmm. in pushing both political decolonization and the epistemic decolonization. And for Nkrumah, he was very active in the establishment even of the Institute of African Studies in Lekon, in, in, in Ghana. And it was him who gave the first speech uh, at the official opening of that institute. And the speech was entitled very well, the African genius. Whereby he was saying, in decolonizing, we need to capture the African genius, which was destroyed or uh, uh, destroyed by colonialism. And when he opened the first International Congress of Africanism in 1964, his speech was African cultural renaissance. And again, he was emphasizing that we need to link African thought, African uh, <clears throat> knowledge with the, the global Africa, which is really the, 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 the diaspora and the, the, the Pan-African. Then you will see also the same uh, issues taking place in Nigeria at the University of Ibadan, where there was a strong nationalist school uh, at the University of Ibadan. And uh, you can go to Nairobi uh, the, the Nairobi memo of 1968 to 1969, which posed a fundamental question, why can't Africa be at the center so that we can view other cultures in relationship to it? So it is really a reconfiguring, whereby we begin from Africa into the world, rather than from Europe into Africa. And uh, you can go to Dakar in Senegal again, where there was Cheikh Adatiop, and uh, he 
didn't. Fantastic work in trying to change Eurocentric history and the privilege uh, Egypt as, a, as, a, as an African civilization. And uh, you can go on to the Association of African Universities, which was formed in 1967, which gives us a very clear definition of what an African university must be like. It says the truly African university must be that one which draws its inspiration from its environment, not a transplanted tree, but growing from a seed that is planted and nurtured in the African soil. Even Mobutu Sesoseko with his notorious dictatorship, he tried with the Ontesichite ideology in Zaire. Uh, <clears throat> and, the, and the issue is what happened to these initiatives? But before we even say that, maybe I also reflect on what was happening in Dar es Salaam at the University of Dar es Salaam. Nyerere was the president. University of Dar es Salaam became also another maker for knowledge. Uh, uh, um, Walter Rodney had to come there. Uh, Terence Ranger, who trained me for my PhD, also went there and they began to, to develop the Marxist, the political economy school in Dar es Salaam. And uh, <clears throat> of course, I must also refer to the formation of, uh, of CODESRIA, the Council for the Development of Social Science in, 19, in 1973 as an intellectual home for <clears throat> Marxist and nationalists and Pan-Africanists. And uh, that organization is still there, is still standing, and uh, it is still trying to produce knowledge from an Africa-centered point of view. But the issue is, if there was all these initiatives, what happened to them that were still talking to about decolonization now. I think this now takes us to the 1970s. And it takes us exactly to the, to the intervention of the Washington consensus and the rise of neoliberal corporationist uh, imperialism, uh, which actually turned universities into corporates and they turned knowledge into commodities and they turned the students into, into customers and they turned the university in the words of Mahmoud Mamdani into a marketplace. So when we're decolonizing, we're decolonizing also the legacies, but at the same time, the realities of today of commercialization and the corporatization of knowledge. So I'm moving very fast, but that, that is an explanation of the fall of the, the initiatives. And they, as, those, as that was happening, then another thinking was coming in. And that thinking is what is called post-colonialism, post-structuralism, and the post-modernism. And I don't have time to, to, to talk about it, but it tended to, to be very aggressive towards what it called the meta-narratives, Marxism, nationalism, and all that. It was very aggressive to that. And they're saying, no, what is needed is really to, 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 to highlight the complexities. And when, when, when the question was posed about the horizon of post-colonial thinking, uh, Homi Baba said, we are not committed to perfect perfectibility of the world. We just want to show complexities. But yeah. the decolonial uh, interventions is not about just showing complexities. In a decolonial thinking, there is a clear uh, idea about the future. Another world is possible. Another knowledge is possible. And uh, the future which is envisioned is the pluriversal future, whereby different knowledges of the world, they come together into an ecology of knowledges to in hence and they enrich African experience and to move us out of the current crisis we are in. And I'm moving towards the end now. Um, and, the, and the issue is about the research and uh, decolonization. Why are we back to decolonization? Of course, there are people who are saying there are two major uh, issues we must take into reality. There are those who are following Habermas who are saying we need to complete the incomplete project of modernity. Then there are those who are saying, no, no, no. If the project of modernity is the one which actually has coloniality underneath, one which was propelled by enslavement, by racism, by colonialism, by racial capitalism, we don't want to complete that one. That is a death project. What we need to complete is the decolonization project. So there, is, there, there are those contesting uh, uh, issues. 
but the second uh, 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 the reason why we are we're, we're continuing with the issue of, of of decolonizing is to also notice that the cognitive empire is still operational and we need not to confuse colonization with colonialism at the Ipatan school of history there was this deep debate in the 1960s uh, the veteran historian Jacob Adeajai wrote a popular article in the 70s, which was called Colonialism, a mere episode in African history. And that inaugurated what is called the episodic approach to colonialism, that it was an episode, it came and it went. But he was already challenged in 1981 by Peter Eke, who presented his inaugural lecture, Colonialism and the Social Structure. And his argument was that don't be don't be complacent about colonial. Colonialism is not an event. It is a modern power structure, which is a vive dismantlement of its physical features. So don't be confused by the dismantlement of the physical features to think that therefore colonialism is no longer there. The same thing which we must think about apartheid, that when it withdraws in terms of its physical features, don't think that apartheid is gone. If it, is a, if it was a system of power, it then lives in institutions. It also lingers in, uh, in the sites of the people. And it lingers in the systems uh, <clears throat> and the structures. Uh, so so, so it, it, it's important to think, to think, to think that way. And, the, and, the, and the, the question then which comes is the question of, we need, when we're talking about decolonization, we're talking about a second site on colonialism. What is called second mm -hmm. site? I think it was also introduced by WEP Tupoa is becoming popular now. To relook at why are we in a mess, the mess we, where we are. And when we have a relook, we also must be very careful that we must not be decadent. And the being decadent is to plunge into a crisis. And you then try to use those knowledges which plunged you into a crisis as well, possible well. was to take you out. That, that would be decadence. You will need to look for other knowledges. If you are plunged in a crisis, you cannot use the same things which made you fall into a pit to come out. You can't, you need to find something else. And this is why we are trying to, 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 do, to do what we're doing. And I want to, to close by saying, uh, <clears throat> we will need to, to really not to, be, not to be parochial in our doing of, 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 of decolonizing. We need to target the structures to dismantle <clears throat> the infrastructures of yeah. coloniality. And the infrastructures of coloniality are actually structures, systems, and the institutions. And the universities are very problematic in the sense that they are a structure of modernity. University of Zululand is in Zululand, is it of Zululand? You will need to, to, to ask deeper questions this is why we talk about universities in Africa, not African universities. They are not yet African universities. We are trying to make them African universities so that they really, where they are located, they reflect where they are lo located. They can be located anywhere, but still reflecting uh, where they came from as an idea. So, so it's important to think, to think about that. And also we need to think also about of course, the epistemic, I think the vice chancellor exhausted that. But I, I wanted to end by saying, uh, having said all this, we are not talking theory here. We need to be talking praxis. And the praxis means that we need to say, having listened to such a lecture, what mm -hmm. will I do at the university, at UNISU? Fundamentally, the starting point is to reflect on on the locus on, on the locus of, 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 of on the location of of, uni, of university of Zululand. And the, what does that mean? It fundamentally means we need to then say we must think from where we are. We can't think from else, elsewhere. It's, it's, it's a problem. We must think from where we are. And fundamentally it means that we need to take our location seriously as a departure point, not as an end in itself. Yeah. And the, fundamentally, this means that we think about Un, Unizul is located in, a, in, a, in South Africa, is located in a coastal area, 
is a located in a, in, a, in a rural area, let's not be negative about all these locations. These locations are our departure points. We need to think yeah. about them, how to leverage these locations. Uh, of course, here I will smell like a historian by saying <laughs> we need to think really about the Nguni formations, the Nguni yeah. civilizations. What can we leverage from the Nguni civilizations? Which basically they were all coastal located in the coast before they dispersed into the interior, before they dispersed into, into the region, up to, up to Tanzania, up to Kenya. And we will need to, to study them. It doesn't mean that they were, everything was negative about them. There was a lot of, of, of positive things. This is why we draw the concept of Ubuntu from them. So it is important that we think from a, this what is, I'm, I'm just a, expressing what it means to think from where you are. And this will actually mean reading even South Africa, reading Africa from Zululand. What does that mean? Whereby there was a dispersal of people from the coast into the interior. And how, how, what does it mean to think from there? And I'm thinking also here, because of this dispersal, we have dispersal of, of, of a common language in, 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 in Eswatini, in Zambia, in Malawi, in Zimbabwe. In, there, there is that language which is we, some will call a cross-border vehicular language. How do we leverage that language, for instance, for cementing the issue of, uh, of, uh, of, of, uh, of, uh, of regional integration? If they are all these languages which are which, which, which are related and they, they can be used to bring people together rather than to divide people. So again, I'm thinking here in relation to your, to your idea about the note on African thought. And I'm thinking also about, when we think about black thought, African thought, we will need also to think about the performing arts, the cultures, the music. Yeah. The, the, we, we must also think about the gender, and the feminism from where we are. And when we're thinking about gender and the feminism from where we are, I'm thinking about Amakosigazi and the power, the power which they have. I'm thinking about where from Zululand you can have a very strong history department, you can have a very strong archaeology department because there are so many sites of previous big civilizations. Let me end here. I can speak until tomorrow. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ndlovu Gacheni. I must say I did expect you to do justice to your presentation and you did much more than that. And uh, I do want to appreciate the, the fact that um, like a good doctor, you were able to do a number of things. The symptoms are knowable and we have known them. But they, and they, what you were acting like was somebody who was doing a proper and deep diagnosis. But in providing that diagnosis, you also provided to what I may call uh, not only a therapy, but also the prognosis. And what you provided us was really a warning that as the disease progresses and as the therapy gets in, we must not be complacent. But at the same time, you also gave us um, food for thought. And I would actually say, to, if, if I was in control, I would expect uh, every member of staff of the University of Zuland to, to read your paper. Because uh, what you have taken us is take us to, through a historical journey that has also been traveled by many people who have been in this uh, area who are many who are very concerned and uh, the very terms that you talked about. And I would even want to say all the books that you prescribed or were in your text would be books that uh, should be a prescription as part of the antidote to the damage that colonialism has done to us. As you put it, that uh, Ngugi uh, looked at it from the, what are the consequences of this uh, cognitive empire? What does it mean for African people? And uh, therefore what we do need is that notion of 
the idea of a uh, therapy. But uh, before you go, there were a number of questions that the colleagues have posted. And I would like to read one of them to you so that you can uh, deal with it. <clears throat> the question is from, comes from Professor Nicolaitis. It says, in what way is epistemology utilized to reinforce the disproportionate power relations that exist between the global north and global south? Mm -hmm. In what way is epistemology utilized to reinforce these disproportionate power relations that exist mm -hmm. between global north mm -hmm. and global south? Mm -hmm. Maybe that's the first uh, question that you may want to uh, deal with. I thought uh, I thought Professor Epe, I dealt with that question already. <laughs> yeah, I did say, but I want you to to, to yeah, rephrase yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. In fact, um, the I think the question is worthy really repeating as the the colleague has put it because it is really the elephant in the room, and yes. the, and the, this elephant in the room uh, is not is not outside us. I think this is where I need to come in. Uh, yes. A person like me. I'm speaking as I'm speaking, but I'm a product of a westernized university. And when I'm saying westernized university, it doesn't mean I went to Oxford or to Cambridge or if I was trained at the University of Zimbabwe. It is in Zimbabwe, but it is still trained as in Western ways. So the epistemological uh, problem is in us. And, the, and, the, and the, 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 the therapeutic part is that we need to, 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 to enter into what we call learning to unlearn in order to relearn. That's a painstaking process. Yeah. It, it, it means also self-denial because we, we reinforce. African scholars are actually pouring into, into reinforcement of a structure of knowledge which came from a particular history because of our training. And sometimes because we are not aware that we are doing that. Yeah. Thirdly, because we were produced really to contribute to that. And it is now that we have the decolonial consciousness that we can use that to then try to do what uh, Samia Amin calls delinking. But delinking doesn't mean you delink and you break yourself from the world. It means you delink, prioritize your own issues and then connect on your own terms. You, yeah. you, you, you see, you see, you see this, this, even Sami Amin is always mis, misread to say he was saying, let's cut ourselves from the world. But he was saying, no, no, no. It means you delink in order to reprioritize and repurpose knowledge, which is of service to you. Then you connect to the world of, 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 of knowledge, the wider world of knowledge on your own terms. And the, to me, that, that, that is the, that is the way to, to move. Yeah, Prof. and um, yes, in the Professor audience. Siebe. Yes, yes. Professor Siebe, can I, I request that first we take the response from Dr. Akome, and then I see that there are a number of questions, and then we engage Professor Antofukacheni later in terms of questions and answers as part of the discussion. Thank you very much. Okay, I've got no problem. And with those, with that intervention, can I ask Professor uh, uh, Dr. Akpume to then respond because uh, I think I was almost uh, reacting to the provocation of the paper. And uh, I think uh, Dr. Akpume would probably uh, pick up on that uh, uh, provocation that has just been delivered. Good, thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, thank you, Vice Chancellor. Um, protocols observed. Uh, distinguished speaker, Professor Nilovo Gacheni, thank you very much. You you fooled me when when you started by saying you would like to rather than offer a lecture, you would write like a conversation. I was a bit fooled because I thought, well, this is going to be very easy. It's going to be not going to be as difficult as I imagined. But it didn't quite turn out to be that. Although your tone has been very conversational and, and gentle. The ideas and the provocations are quite um, quite heavy, I would say. Uh, but I'd like to tell you that I am an Achadian. I'm not a Foucauldian. Uh, so I'm quite, I consider myself a very African. Uh, but I want to thank you very much for this very, very, what I would say is encyclopedic. It's uh, wide ranging. 
you know, the depth and the breadth of your presentation is really mind boggling. And um, as um, Prof. Siebe has said, it's not that we expect less of you. Thank you very much. Uh, the job of a respondent is can be quite difficult, um, especially when you have a speaker of this nature, uh, because you are looking for a handle to get on the on the presentation, and it's not very easy. It's quite quite, quite wide ranging. I'd like to begin quickly from from where you have ended, and you said something about a decolonial scholar who recommends delinking, and how you say he's often misread. Um, that's a path of scholarship that I have found quite interesting and that I'm hoping to, to work on. Um, many conversations I have with the person who here at UNISU is how there are responses to decolonization. And I would say perhaps some of these responses are deliberate misreadings, uh, as I would assume a conscious or subconscious effort would derail the entire project of decolonization. So there's a lot of, and I want you to respond to this also. You know, there are people who say there's conceptual confusion. Now everything is decolonization. What do these guys mean? What is coloniality? What is colonization? Mm. My initial response is a deliberate uh, attempt to create epistemic confusion where there is none um, mm. um, and, to, and to downplay which again is the nature, it is one of the main characteristics of Euro-modernist knowledge production, mm -hmm. is to devalue, to demean, and to downplay any kind of knowledge that does not issue from, and does not serve the interests of, uh, of, uh, of the colonial empire. Uh, so that, that is a very powerful one. You keep asking the question, and it's a question that the Vice Chancellor also asked in her presentation, uh, what do we do? You repeated that word a lot. And I like that uh, orientation towards praxis, that orientation towards, towards what is pragmatic. And you have given several interesting um, uh, uh, hints in that uh, direction. Um, you talk repeatedly about, and I really like this because it's in very simple terms, the universities which we occupy now, including this one, and you made very direct mention to it, we are trying to make them African universities. Mm. I don't think any university has expressed that desire as clearly as the University of Zulu and so far. Mm. Mm. So what is an African university? I'll push the question back to you. Mm. Uh, and I would also like my colleague here, Professor Morgan, to weigh in if uh, the chair gives him an opportunity. Because one of the critiques they gave against uh, decolonization as, as a, an intellectual movement uh, as a as a theoretical uh, 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 argument is the idea that it's oppositional. Mm. We understand that it has to be oppositional because um, it is anti-colonial, it is anti-empire, it's anti-imperialist. Uh, but then it has also to be propositional. Mm. Uh, we can't always talk about what the university in Africa ought not to be at the expense of what the university in Africa ought to be mm -hmm. and how it should become what it ought to be. So that would go again uh, in line with your question is where you suggested that the first thing to do would be to reflect, uh, to think, which is a very powerful point. Um, and perhaps in your subsequent interventions, I would be grateful if you can expand a bit on what it means to think and how it is the role of us as scholars and as the university to think. And what do you say about the interesting interest or the kind of really serious interest in universities being places for the production of entrepreneurs? Mm. Uh, what does it say about the, the neoliberal, you made reference to this also, the neoliberal takeover of the university. You gave a very, very concise, but also very powerful historicization, a very concise historicization of, of the African university and the role it has played in, in the, the genealogy of black thinking and black thoughts. You made references to the investments in Dar es Salaam, Ibadan. Um, you didn't mention Makerere, but I think Makerere is also there. Speaking especially from the point of view of a literary study, the field which I'm from, uh, remember the African Literature uh, uh, Conference and some of the issues that had Ngugi Wathiongo and Chinua Achebe in conversation and in contestation. So what, what would you say about the need for the African University to be a site, a place of reflection? Um, because I'm, I'm really bothered 
by the idea that we need to produce entrepreneurs. Because at the end of the day, some of what we say about producing entrepreneurs in African universities is to produce young girls and guys who would be waiters in our game reserves. Mm -hmm. We go to some of these game reserves when we go on retreats and we recognize some of our students. Is, is that what we are about? Mm -hmm. Is it to produce somebody who get a job of 3,000 rands? And then say, yes, they have a job. We did our work, we produced, we gave them, we gave them, um, we gave them uh, the business community what they wanted, uh, as I this side of thinking. And then the role of students, however young they are, mm -hmm. in, in, in being involved in the projects of uh, decolonization. Um, I, you also said a lot about the cognitive empire. There's an aspect of it that I, I, I would wish that you could expand on a bit in if we have more time for engagement. Um, the ways in which, and I think that's the question, what you want, I think it's linked to the question uh, uh, Prof. Siepe raised from the floor, uh, how knowledge production reinforces um, colonial power. Um, I want you to comment on this. I, I'm of the view that knowledge, colonial knowledge and colonial uh, power are, are both mutually constituted. Uh, colonial power, in my view, especially in terms of coloniality, which I try to explain as contemporary colonization. If historicization can help us understand the difference between colonization, I like to call it historical colonialism, and colonialism as historical colonization, coloniality as contemporary, ongoing. Um, how does current knowledge production re reinforce? So I, I believe current, the current empire will not exist without knowledge. Um, although it also exists on the basis of sheer force. I mean, bombs, uh, um, America, for instance, continues producing bombs and, and there's always these wars, but it would not be possible without the knowledge that continues to be produced. And as we have said, to be reinforced, sometimes unwittingly by some of us even who are the butt of the joke. I mean, we, 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 we on this side suffer a lot from from um, the expression of coloniality, yet some of us are involved in its uh, um, reinforcement. Um, maybe I'll end here because there's a lot, a lot. I, sure, in, sure, sure, sure. And I, I actually desired to respond to you. I hoped, I hoped I was going to get the paper, but I'm not regretting that. Uh, but I knew I was going to learn a lot just from listening to you here. I like the historical, concise history you gave of again. The movements, turns, the nationalist turns, the radical turns, and the resurgence, and that helps us to understand where we are. Mm -hmm. Goes back to your first point about the current moment. Mm -hmm. While it's an exciting moment, you say it's also scary. You didn't particularly expand on why you say it's scary. Mm -hmm. So maybe if you have a, a moment, why the, the moment looks it looks uh, mm -hmm. looks like good things are going to happen, especially when we speak from South Africa, where there's a, a lot of these debates is allowed. Mm. Unlike the US, for instance, where mm -hmm. there are panics. Mm -hmm. we, we had a conference in October and we had a speaker from the US and she went on and on exhorting us why we need to be decolonial and why we need to push this teaching. Then, then I asked her, but what's going on in America? Mm -hmm. Where there is now the fear that we can't even say these things uh, uh, that we are saying so freely here, even sometimes with support of the state. Lastly, there is this interesting article I read uh, from a colleague in, I think she is in the Western Cape and um, in South African uh, University, who says our paper is titled Why Decolonization Will Fail in South Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. She wasn't giving a, a, a negative purpose, but she was just observing that the lecturers who will I think we lecturers who stand in class, mm. uh, over and above people like you, give us mm. the ideas. Theorists, policymakers, mm. vice chancellor can do, she can organize this all she wants. Mm. You guys can give us theories in, mm. uh, in, in, in seminars of this nature all you want. Mm. But that individual who is going to stand before first year students, that um, uh, individual who is going to stand before second year students. And, and the success or otherwise of these ideas will depend a lot on what they do in class or what they do not do. And that's what she was saying, and that's a Bandeya, and she was saying, because the 
person who delivers knowledge at the end of the day, one of the most important uh, points in the knowledge production chain is not yet changed. That's her conclusion. And you made reference to it when you display the great when you told us about four typologies of the of the scholar, of the African scholar. Mm -hmm. Dr. Baldwin who is still uh, immersed in the old ways, is entrenched. Mm -hmm. Some don't even know. Some will argue with you that oh, what's this uh, the colonial process nonsense. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they would come with Plato, they would come with Aristotle and come with Habermas and all of that. Mm -hmm. Then there are those who are liminal, who are still on the side, okay, what are these guys doing? Is it mm -hmm. something, oh, I see the vice chancellor, I see my intelligence there, okay, let me go there. Uh, but what are they really doing? Mm. Then there are those who are radical. Um, mm. But then there are those who I think are the most dangerous. You mentioned mm. the comparative bourgeois mm. approach. To, okay, let's see what we can get from it. Mm. Uh, some people can actually choose to be decolonial because it's mm. going to mm. make them invited and they might get some positions. Mm. So what do you think can be done? Going mm. back to the question that you and the vice chancellor have been asking, mm. what can be done mm. to deal with these people, these individuals. Uh, mm -hmm. Now we kind of get them on our side, mm -hmm. uh, what we involve in getting them on our side. But overall, I want to close by saying, I would be glad to hear, okay, there's one more thing I also wanted to mention. I like what you said, which I think is very deep about, and you use the example of apartheid. Apartheid may have withdrawn mm -hmm. in terms of some of its more spectacular characteristics, they are no longer there, mm -hmm. but then it's not gone. Mm -hmm. uh, in the same way, the, the subjugation, the hegemony that characterizes colonial over, uh, over, overthrow is not gone, mm -hmm. even though it has transmuted. Mm -hmm. So perhaps we need language. What do you think would be the role of language, terminologies, in terms of historicization? Mm -hmm. Because it is in history that we say apartheid is past. Mm -hmm. We confine apartheid to the past. Mm -hmm. And then we know that its features are still present, mm -hmm. but in, in an attempt to create the impression that this is now past, which is a very brilliant tactic of colonialism, it pretends that it's gone, but it's still there. Mm -hmm. What do you say about the role of language, mm -hmm. the role of a new grammars and metaphors? And that's one of the things we are committing ourselves to do at UNIS with the adoption of Chopra Siebe will remember this and the vice chancellor commitment to new grammars and mm. metaphors and vocabularies of change mm. that can mm. enable the thinking, and I'm, I'm, I'm invoking and Morgan over here again, of possible decolonial African features. I thank you, Professor. No, thank you so much. Thank you so much for that uh, very useful uh, response to the lecture. And I like, I like the, the, the idea of responses because even what I'm going to give you here, I, I hate answers because if we have answers, we could have closed the universities long ago. We will have answered the questions long, long ago. But uh, I will try to, to, to respond to your response, which is a very good response, if I may say. And let me start <clears throat> by saying, uh, I'm speaking here I'm wearing three caps. Uh, the first cap is that I'm an intellectual, I'm an academic. The second cap, I have very strong uh, ideas about decolonization from an activist point of view. The third cap, in the past, the, my last five years at the University of South Africa, I was actually part of the extended management of the university. <clears throat> I I worked in the vice chancellor's office in my last past uh, uh, five years at the University of South Africa. So I have experience in researching the idea of uh, the problems of colonialism and the, and, the, and the decolonization. Secondly, I've been involved in the, from an activist point of view, the advocation <clears throat> and the, all that of the idea of decolonizing. And thirdly, I have bent my fingers by actually going into the heat of trying to implement decolonization within one of the biggest universities in South Africa, which is the University of, of, of South Africa. So when I was speaking here, I'm drawing from these three rivers uh, really to reflect 
of course, you are uh, Professor CMP referred to my book, which is Coloniality of Power in Postcolonial Africa, which was published in 2013, and it has been reissued by Cotesria in 2022. But I will refer uh, you to the book which I did while I was in the Vice Chancellor's office, which is the book on epistemic freedom in Africa, deprovincialization and decolonization. I am referring to that one because that one was published in 2018. I was actually the acting executive director of the change management within the vice chancellor's office. And uh, I was bombarded with the practical questions uh, as I tried to mobilize the entirety of the university constituency behind the idea of decolonizing and transforming the university. Uh, I, I always joked with the, the vice chancellor that when I was in his office, I felt like I was a, a political commissar. I needed to, to make sure that the unions understand, the, the, the women formations understand, the intellectual formations understand. Uh, and, and this takes us to, to the challenges of implementation of, of decolonization because the universities as a structures, they work with committees, the committees of the council, the committees of the Senate, and those committees are refusing to change their motors of motors operandi. When the idea comes in those committees, it undergoes a, what we call it is turned into compliance. It is turned into what is already known. So institutions posture, uh, they they absorb radical change, defang it, discipline it, it end up reformist rather than revolutionary. That is my, that is this I draw from my experience in administration. And when, when the council of the university then said, we agree with the agenda of decolonization and issued a communique to the rest of the university to say, Decolonizing, transforming is not an option, it is an imperative. As a person who was in the vice chancellor's office, I jumped up, oh, now we are empowered. The council of the mm. university has accepted the concept of decolonizing the university. And I guess the, 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 the negative repercussions, because it is issue, issued from the council and, uh, and uh, because it is issued to the university, some colleagues took it. Let's just comply in order to maintain our position. Sure. Yes. Yeah, you, 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 you see, you see the problem. So we, 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 we practically, we ended up saying, uh, a is going to be in the vice chancellor's office, uh, pushing the, the, the issue of decolonization, but he's not the one who is going to go to every department, to every college, to every faculty to do the decolonization. It is the people embedded there who have to do. The, 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 the decolonization, bearing in mind that the curriculum which we want to decolonize is produced by us, the problematic one. And the issue is we need to produce the other one using the same forces which produce the wrong curriculum. So, so I, I really draw from a real practical experience. And when we then, uh, uh, this, this issue of transformation, decolonization is no longer an option it is, it is an imperative. Guess what happens? Academics are very good. Leaders of faculties are very good. They will, they will give you glossy presentations at Senate. Mm -hmm. They will give you glossy presentations at Senate. And they know, as for us, we've done this, we've done this, we've done that, we've done that. We, we are now left with only three modules. We are, do, we are doing very well in decolonizing. And when we are seated, you can tell that they are not doing anything at all. <laughs> and if yeah. anything, if I was a vice chancellor, I would just listen and listen and say, Jovu, if I were a dean, stop there, don't do anything. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 Professor CMP, if you are a dean, continue. Uh, Professor who and who uh, appoint me, let's have more conversations. Mm -hmm. And because I'll be I'll be I'll be listening and the sensing. The depth 
of, 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 of the changes which we want to do. And I, I can see the artificiality. I can see somebody who is genuine. I can see somebody who is trying to, to, to just make me happy. So I'm, I'm, I, I, I work on all that. But I'm talking here really practical. So I am not really just somebody who comes from the theoretical side of things. Yeah. I, I, I really come from the thick and the thin of it. And, yeah, I, and I know how difficult, how difficult it is to do, to do these things. And let because, me interrupt you. I'd, I'd like yes. you to take some questions. Yes. Uh, let's just read one or two questions that I want you to, you to deal with because uh, our time is almost uh, against us. Any, yes. Anyway, it's very important that you say that because at the exact 9.30, I will need to go because I, I actually postponed the meeting which was supposed to start yes. at 9. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, the question yes. that um, is uh, being asked yeah. here, it, well, it's a, it's a comment with a question. I would like to seek a clarity on your understanding of how significant is ideology for Black major scholars as they try to contribute to, in the body of knowledge. I think you were sort of touched on, on that. Yes. Uh, yes. uh, 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 so, and uh, let me just move to the next one. Uh, but you might say one or two sentences because, uh, like you say, time is not uh, on your side and it's not on our side. There's a, a question that says, uh, well, it, it's more of a comment and almost a suggestion of what needs to be done. It says uh, it's from uh, uh, Professor Neil L. Evans saying, Europeanism, European imperialism devastated our natural resources in Africa, 80% of South Africa was covered by forest when Europeans arrived. This is how it has been reduced to only uh, 5%. In sust sustainable development, we can't ignore the regeneration of the rich indigenous environmental heritage with a more social economy. This mm -hmm. can be done quite quickly, 20 to 40, 40 years in Zuland, thanks to our subtropical climate a case study, a sugar cane farm tent, twin stream environmental education center. But the, what you see here is that the, mm -hmm. the embracing of the concept of what is possible, which is something that you touched on, mm -hmm. but the, the issue of ideology is something that you may wanna say in just three minutes, then what you will do will just wrap up and uh, ask uh, the, for a vote of thanks. Yeah, yeah, I think one thing for certain, I want to, answer these questions and respond to them in a very in a in a in a broad sense. I think what 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 Prof C we, we we need to think about knowledge to live by education for life. Yeah. Vis-a-vis yes, vis yes. vis encrypted knowledge, encrypted education, which is for domination, control and exploitation. Yes, so, yes, thank you. So, so what we do is, what we're trying to do here is to decrypt encrypted knowledge, yeah. which is then used in alliance with imperialism, capitalism, a, a heteronormative uh, sexism and all that. So decolonization has this, we, knowledge needs to be with us. It, is, it must be part of us. It is something which we must live by. We need knowledge to know which foods to eat, which ones are killing. A, which yeah. which food to eat? Which one is killing us? That's that's knowledge which is supposed to be down to earth to, to be with us. It cannot be expect knowledge. Expect knowledge is encrypted knowledge which is now uh, owned by a few people, and now it is only several who can come and and they explain this. Uh, it means knowledge was stolen from the people and then made into expect knowledge, and then pushed, kicked up to stratosphere. And they want to bring it from stratosphere down to atmosphere so that everyone understand the knowledge which we have. So that's, that's, that's one thing for certain. Then the issue which I was also wanted, this issue of, of ecology and environment, I think is an important one. It's an important one in the sense that when the VC uh, uh, gave the opening remarks, he talked about coloniality of being, coloniality of knowledge, coloniality of power. But the other coloniality is coloniality of nature. Yeah. Where nature is actually under, under, under modernity, coloniality is redefined as a natural resource, which is available at infinitum for exploitation, leading to the, all these ecological uh, and environmental disasters. Uh, yeah. Nature is a being. Human beings mm -hmm. are beings 
among other yeah. beings. Trees are beings. Mountains are beings. A flowing water is a being. And we need an ecological understanding of each other in order to live well. I will, look, yeah. I will, I will end there, Prof. Yeah, just uh, from my side, I would like to say, in the same way that you quoted Ngugi, in this uh, paper, which is uh, what you were, you were becoming an embodiment of it. The book, uh, the writing on the intellectual legacy of Pan-Africanism, Ngugi said the following, that the, in our history of struggle against colonialism, the role of the intellect, of the mind, of the idea, a caring idea, a committed idea, ideas that capture the essence of the historical moment was an important, often decisive ingredient. And I do think that the notion of a note for African thought can be and should be that decisive ingredient in the same way that the idea of freedom served. But like you also say, Ngui continues also in the same chapter that the sadly, the questioning mind in Africa has become suspect. Mm-hmm. The mind that wants to be judged against the highest possible professional standard is suspect. Originality is even more suspect. Mm-hmm. Many intellectuals have been bounded to prison, detention camps, mm-hmm. to exile, mm-hmm. and often into your graves. Mm-hmm. And that is probably one of the warnings that you are also, mm-hmm. that was also in your subtext, mm-hmm. that those who dare to challenge power mm-hmm. and power that uh, sustains mm-hmm. coloniality mm-hmm. find themselves uh, driven out of uh, Africa, mm-hmm. driven out mm-hmm. of the institutions. And also mm-hmm. that is a warning that uh, mm-hmm. some of us take mm-hmm. from your presentation. Mm-hmm. But coming back to the university, what uh, you've actually given us is really again, what I may call a prescription. But most importantly, especially for the vice chancellor, is the point that you're raising, that there's always sometimes, because academics are conformist, mm-hmm. the artificial, artificial embracing of the idea, mm-hmm. but with mm-hmm. nothing done about it. Mm-hmm. that the way you end up being in a perpetual state of advocacy, but no movement, same curriculum. And this means I think maybe there should be more conversations as one of the contributors had actually said on the chat box mm-hmm. to have a deeper understanding of these issues. Mm-hmm. Because as we say, in any therapy, there's a prognosis mm-hmm. and we need mm-hmm. to check how far we're dealing with this. Uh, uh, indeed, indeed. With that, I want to thank you, uh, Professor Andrew, but the, the Thanks for the whole of this session will come from none other than the DVC for teaching and learning, Professor Nomlomo. Professor Nomlomo is, if you are in the audience, would you be do us the honor of uh, thanking uh, the members, uh, Professor Kajeni, the vice chancellor, and most importantly, I want to make sure that uh, we don't lose uh, that concept that the, the, the VC actually raised about the, the disruption of the power dynamics mm-hmm. and social dynamics, mm-hmm. uh, building on all those elements that you had raised, that of how coloniality of knowledge manifests itself from the a perspective of the biography of knowledge, the geography of knowledge, but also most importantly, the concept that W.E. Du Bois put it, which is that it, Coloniality of power of knowledge must address the existential issues as well. Mm-hmm. And the notion that says, you know, I think it's also a book that is all of us must read by W. Du Bois, the, the soul of black folks, where there's always that question, what, how does it feel to be a problem? Mm-hmm. And if we are not able to deal with these seminal works, then what we're going to end up with be mere compliance. Professor, mm-hmm. Nomlomo, are you there? Morning, Prof. Yes, I'm here. Good morning. Go ahead. Thank you. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Yes, I'm here. The chair, Professor Sleeper. 
Uh, good morning, good morning, colleagues. Mm -hmm. I will I'll be very brief because I'm aware that the uh, uh, block has to leave. Prof, uh, so, firstly, mine is very easy just to uh, say a vote of thanks to the participants of the, of the webinar. Uh, first and foremost, I have to thank our Vice Chancellor, Professor Paulison Dosse, for, for having uh, this kind of intellectual engagement, which I think is very, very crucial and critical, especially at this point in time when we are trying to drive our uh, strategy in the Vision 27 uh, and also trying to position ourselves at the old uh, for African thought. So thank you very much, Prof. You, you've set a very, very a great tool, which uh, for me, if I were to make my own analysis, was very much in sync with what Professor Ondro Bukajene talked about in, in his presentation. Thank you, Prof. Thank you. And then um, I have to thank our guest speaker, Professor uh, Samuel Ondro Bukajene. You know, I don't have any <coughs> words. <coughs> If I were to be given the whole day, I would say quite a lot. But <laughs> I'm in the interest of time, excuse me, sorry, sorry for this. Professor I thank you very, very much. Uh, I know they say uh, with what I'm going to say, it doesn't really uh, justify the depth and the rigor of your of your presentation. I will just be superficial, but. You must know that uh, in our culture, there is nothing more than thank you and go see Siahonga. But uh, you have just given us uh, food for thought. Your presentation was uh, very, very uh, deep and uh, it touched on the most critical issues that we are grappling with, not only in our South African context, but uh, uh, in our context as the, uh, as, as, uh, the continent. So it was intellectually stimulating. Uh, you started by raising very, very critical questions that I'm not going to repeat to be in the interest of time. And you also allowed us, us to reflect on your, or, or, on your presentation by also asking very, very uh, crucial and critical questions and you challenged us to think, uh, particularly uh, in terms of this hegemony of the global north versus the marginalization of the global south, which the vice chancellor also referred to in her opening uh, address. Uh, thank you very much for uh, such a stimulating uh, a presentation, especially with regard to the notion of uh, us as uh, as sites of a uh, data gathering, but we don't have space in terms of uh, uh, the generation of theories and models. I think that is very very critical to us, and I think that's something that we have to to to, to think about. And uh, yeah, thank you so much also for uh, challenging us to have a relook of what we are doing, particularly in terms of our curricula uh, in our institutions. And you touched my button when you talked about language, uh, because uh, my heart is very close to that. We are currently sitting with linguistic, linguistic imperialism. And uh, the, the notion of linguistic imperialism is very critical when we're talking about recolonization, because it was still a, 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 submerged under linguism, I think we will have to really revisit what we mean by decolonization. So thank you so, so much, uh, uh, Professor Ndobu. Uh, you know, we, we, if we had to have more time, I think we would be sitting in this room for quite a long time, but what I wait that you have to run. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. We will take note of all those critical questions that you have uh, uh, posed in terms of challenging us uh, uh, so that we can see what we can take uh, in terms of, of our curriculum um, uh, re renewal or transformation, as well as what we are currently doing in our uh, space that is the classroom. And on behalf of UNISULU, please accept our thanks and our appreciation for, for your intellectually stimulating presentation. And uh, projects, uh, there was a response to this. There was a response to that, uh, a prof, uh, Dr. Kome. Uh, thank you very much. You made a very critical analysis 
on a presentation and uh, you ask very thought provoking questions. And I hope that we have taken those questions uh, into consideration as we move forward. In fact, I think they lay a very great uh, background and foundation for, 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 for all of us as we move into the space of decolonization. Uh, colleagues, uh, the, the executive leadership and management of institution, which is here. Thank you very much for your time. We are aware that you have very tight schedules. I thank you very much for uh, being here and for your uh, uh, for your presence and listening. We know that we don't have much time. I think you will have many comments to make. And the audience online, uh, colleagues, this wouldn't have been a, a, a success if you were in there. We want to thank you very much for your participation. Your questions, comments have been noted by our chair, Professor Siepe. And uh, it's a pity that uh, we didn't, we don't really have much time, but we have noted your, your active engagement online. We want to thank you very, very much. And then, and uh, I will come to the chair at the end, not that you are the least person, Prof. Uh, I also want to extend our uh, thanks and appreciation to the organizers of this event, this webinar, this our communication and marketing department. And we know that you've been uh, uh, trying to make sure that everything goes well. Thank you very much to all the, the, the entire team as led by the director, Ms. Ndergo. And I can't forget uh, uh, our new project manager, Ms. Lunge Mankai. Thank you very much for the role that you have played to ensure that uh, this uh, uh, seminar is a success. And uh, finally, last but not least, uh, I must say actually the most important person is our chair for the, the, the event, uh, Professor Sipo Siepe. Uh, we thank you very much, Prof. Uh, for ensuring that uh, you direct this program in this way, in this intellectual, uh, in, an, in an intellectually dignified way. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the comments uh, that uh, you, you, you have made, uh, and which uh, kind of also challenging us to think as to what we can do in terms of making sure that uh, we, are, we align ourselves with the, with the, with, with the discourse on a coloniality, decoloniality, and and, uh, and decolonization. Yeah, I always admire uh, the the way you you summarize your succinct summaries whenever there are occasions of this nature, which capture the essence of the presentation or the essence of the discussion. And you've done it again this uh, this morning. So on behalf of Unizulu, we would really like to thank you, for the way that you've been working behind scenes to ensure that this event is the success it is this morning. So thank you very much, colleagues. Uh, I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, adios. Thank you, thank you very Professor much. Professor Siebe. Professor Siebe. I'm listening. I, I, say, I say that uh, that's the uh, authority vested in me, is to say it is closed. <laughs> so, <laughs> <Okay>. but I'd, <laughs> like, I'd, like, I'd like to really emphasize uh, the the you know a, a vote of thanks of a vote of thanks from <laughs> Professor Rumlo and uh, really uh, Professor Job Kachel, you've killed me this morning. You've asked so many questions that are gonna make me restless. Last year when we started this, I, was, I said I was pregnant, and I hoped in November when we finish the the the, the conference that I've given birth to a baby. Now it feels like I'm pregnant again. I don't know what I'm going to do with these Please. many babies. So, Prof. Siepe, yes. I hope you've managed to catch all this because really, as a man working intellectually behind the scenes in ensuring that we achieve this goal that is so big that we set for ourselves as this university, I hope the questions that were asked, you have captured them, and then we're going to use them uh, Professor and Jenny to reignite ourselves and go back to the drawing board because each time I engage with this concept, I feel like I've still not started. I still need to drink more and more. And thank you so much for being here and for being you uh, this morning. Thank you, Prof. Siepe, for the hard work and making sure that we look so good. Thank you very much. Good. Adios.
Amigo. <laughs> thank you so much. I need to run. Yes, thank you so much, Prof. Lovely day. Thank you. <laughs>